guy, he's a teacher of the Jews, and, but he came to Jesus by night so no one would see that he was meeting with Jesus. And, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That word there, see, means to perceive, to understand. It won't make any sense to them about the, the, this concept of the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now watch closely here. What Jesus says next is a little bit different. He says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. So he says there that, you know, if you, before he said to perceive, to see, where here he says to enter into the kingdom of God, that you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. So we get going back to Ephesians here. So we're, we're quickened together with Christ. So we've got this sudzo uh, opeo. Now there's going to be actually these, these uh, words that are used throughout here. There's four of them where we'll see throughout the chapter. These words are very similar but different. And we're going to see this progression here, okay, of the words that Paul uses. By grace you are saved and hath raised us up together. Okay, and the word therefore raised us up together, it's sunergairo, that is to awaken. Okay, to awaken. Let's go to Romans chapter, it means together, of course, together and awaken. So sun, and, which is union, and egairo, which is to awaken. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. And we're going to go to verse 3 and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So I, in, in no doubt, Paul is first when he says the, um, that, that first word, pseudo he's talking about being born again. But then when he says sun, sin, sun egairo here, he's talking about that we were baptized. We were baptized. And that w what that means is, you know, when we're baptized, we are committing to newness of life. We're committed to walking within the new covenant, walking within newness of life, within our new life in Christ Jesus. Okay? Baptism isn't what saves us, but it is our dedication to Christ. It is, our, it is where we are demonstrating to the world what has already taken place inside of us, right? And that we will walk in newness of life. Then, uh, continuing on here, he says, and have and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And there's another another one of these words is sun katizo. So that's together again. And katizo means to seat, to sit down or to set. Okay. The idea conveyed here is one that of authority. When someone is set down in a throne, you, they have a certain amount of authority, or when they sit, sit down to the council, they have a certain amount of authority. They have a certain amount of responsibility. Okay? When, so when, when God has placed you within the church here, okay, he's given the authority to the church in certain matters. We have been essentially placed within a position 
by being a, bro a brother or sister within the church, by being a member within the church, we have a particular amount of authority within God's kingdom now. We are part of God's kingdom. Not only that, we have responsibility. With authority comes responsibility. Not only that, when you sit down, you rest, right? So there's several things being conveyed, conveyed here that we are set down with Christ. He, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Okay, so, yeah, authority, responsibility, and rest that we have here in these, in this, uh, conveyed in this word. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Praise God. He has some things in store for us that we can't even begin to fathom. But he will show us throughout the ages. Now, it goes on to say here, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, the word here for works is ergon. It's the word that we get for labor or toil or energy, to exert energy to put energy forward to toil or to do labor. As we read through the next few chapters here, what we'll find is Paul is contrasting following circumcision, following the law, doing these works versus faith. In this verse, he starts with contrasting between faith and works. Okay? And faith is in contrast to works. Faith is to put one's trust in what someone else has done. It's not the same as works. Faith is not the same as works. It's in contrast to. So when we repented and believed on Jesus Christ, that was not a work. That was plus us putting our trust on what Jesus already did for us. But we see here that, you know, as we go on, it talks about the circumcision in the flesh made by hands uh, versus uncircumcision. Because there was a conflict at that time, especially at the church at Ephesus and in Asia. And we'll get into that in a minute. But first, I want to go back to... Let's go to Romans chapter 3, verse 27 through 31. Just to really pull this contrast in, we can see here it says, Where is boasting then? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So we see here that there's a contrast between believing versus trying to do things to be saved, right? Versus trying to walk a certain path to be saved. And so that's important is that, you know, examining ourselves, when we got saved, it was, was it by our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're saved, of course, you will have a new nature inside of yourself. You should be no question whatsoever. But, you know, examining was it through works? No. It was through faith. And why was it through faith? Paul wants to bring that up because the glory goes to God. 
Jesus Christ is the one who did the work on Calvary. He's the one that did the work on the cross. He's the one that went to the cross for us, not us. But it's not finished there. We get on to verse number 10, and it says, For we are his workmanship. That workmanship means, it's uh, the word poema. It's a product, or actually it is often referred to for fabric that they made, a textile that they would make. For we, plural, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And there's that word again, argon. It's that, that word for energy. So, though we are saved by faith, that doesn't mean that we can just sit back now and say, okay, it's done and God's going to do everything for the rest of my life. No, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility within the church to do good works for the Lord, to follow after the Holy Spirit that God has put within us, to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit, and to, do, to follow the scriptures, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them in good works. Wherefore, okay, so before we, before we go on, you know, keep in mind that the focus here is what Paul is about to say regarding the Mosaic Law and how it was completed with Christ and how Christ brings together both Jews and Gentiles into one church, or into one body, sorry, not one church, but into one body, which is the local New Testament church. As one, the, the word that's, that's used later is anthropos, which means like one race or one mankind. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile within the church. And so when Paul mentions Ergon here, he's no doubt referring to the works of the law, that we're not to rely on the works of the law. And I just bring that up because there are some who are, who are of... Uh, what are referred to as Calvinists, that believe that even if you put faith on Jesus Christ, if you, if you put faith on Jesus Christ, well, it, you know, people can't do that of their own. It has to be from God giving them that faith. Well, sure, God gives a conviction. God brings the word along. But at the, ultimately, we have to choose whether or not we believe and whether or not we turn from our sin. Ultimately, that choice is still left to us. God does not make us choose to follow him. We have to decide. We can't just sit here, you know, waiting around for, for God to strike you with lightning. It doesn't, salvation doesn't work like that. God gives you the word, gives you conviction, pricks your heart, and then you have a choice to make. Do you put your faith and trust in him? Or maybe you go back to Catholicism and try to work your way into heaven. See, and that's where the difference lies here, where that, that Paul is getting at. Faith is in contrast with works, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, of course. We still have a choice to not hear and to also to not have faith. We have that, uh, we have that choice as well, but the, ultimately we have to choose for ourselves if we believe. But uh, let's go ahead. I, I want to focus, take a kind of a, a little bit of a historical focus here on what led up to about, uh, about this church at Ephesus we talked about before how they got started but I want to go back to Acts and I want to I really want to dig in and, and see where Paul is coming from when he's saying these things to the church at Ephesus because I think it'll help to make a little more sense of what's happening here so we're going to go back to Acts chapter 19 21 through 41. So, you know, we want to look back because there, there's quite a story here of Paul and of Ephesus and, and what had taken place there. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him 
Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Now, Asia is, the, you've got Ephesus, and then the surrounding region is called Asia Minor, okay, which they just called Asia during that time. It's not referring to Asia as in Southeast Asia, China, or any of that. It's, it's only talking about this region um, near Ephesus, okay, the, which is, it's now, I believe, modern-day Turkey, yeah? So, in the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. <coughs> For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. Okay, so you've got Demetrius, and then you have the craftsmen. These are two groups here, okay? And Demetrius is a silversmith. He makes silver shrines. So he builds these shrines for, for uh, Diana. And then he goes to the craftsmen and says, I need this, I need this, I need that, okay? And these people in the community at Ephesus, a lot of them were craftsmen. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the whole and the, the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. <clears throat> and the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, the men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were, with, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another. For the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. Okay, so we just want to, real quick before we continue here, let's get the picture of what's going on. So you've got uh, several different groups, several different factions involved. You've got Jews, you've got the Christians, you've got the the. the um, those people who are, are not Jews or Christians that are, that are uh, following after Diana, or, they, or they're, they're the craftsmen, they're trying to make money. Okay, you've got Demetrius here. Okay, and, and you need to understand that the, the Jews, <coughs> as they did in other cities where Paul came, they did not agree with him about uh, him saying that the, the Gentiles do not have to follow the law, that they don't have to be circumcised to, to, to worship God. They did not agree on this point, that they don't have to, so there, was, there were certain points of disagreement, okay, that the Jews had with Paul. So no doubt the Jews here, they, they often would stir up the crowd, the locals, get them riled up. They did this in other cities too, okay, and Paul would have to leave, okay. Um, Thessalonica that happened in Thessalonica also if we go back but we're not going to do that but if you want to go back into Acts you can read about how the Jews did that and so this Alexander <coughs> was called out of the multitude the Jews putting him forward and Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense basically he's going to defend why they've called this group together because now the Romans have seen hey, you guys are meeting together, and this is, what, what are you doing here? Is there going to be some problem? So, that, you know, he's going to make a defense for why this crowd is gathered together. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So they didn't want to hear what he had to say, but it, it's actually a good thing because Alexander was not a good person. We'll see about that 
um, he, he added out against Paul, um, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana? And of the image which fell down from Jupiter, seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet, and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them plead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. So thank God this, this town's clerk came in and intervened, said, what are you guys doing here? This is not lawful. What you're doing here is not lawful. Now, if we go to, uh, let's go to 2 Timothy. Yeah, 2 Timothy 4, 11 through 18. <coughs> and Paul writing here to Timothy. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus. When thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander, the coppersmith, okay, the same guy in, uh, in Acts chapter 19, Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man, with, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be full, fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom for whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we see here about this, this guy, Alexander. He was not particularly, actually, it, it appears that he was even part of the church there at Ephesus, but he was a coppersmith, meaning he made like bells and chimes, you know, things that, that Demetrius would buy from him. And now their income is going down. Why? Because more and more people are becoming Christians, and there's just not a demand for these, tem these Diana temples anymore. So, without that demand, without the money coming in through those temples, Demetrius is pretty upset, and he gets all these people together to, let's get rid of Paul, okay? And Alexander, well, let's go on to, uh, actually, I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, 18 through 20, because he talks, Paul speaks about him again. And I just want to point out that this, this was someone who was a, a brother in the church at one point. He was someone who was a Christian. He was someone who Paul trusted, but who had betrayed Paul. It says here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 through 20, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest, mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, the word blaspheme is to speak impiously or, or vilify or say you know, bad things, and I think he's referring to what they had said about Paul. Now, moving on, 
to Acts. Uh, we're we're going to continue reading in Acts chapter uh, 19. Where did we leave off? Okay, we already finished that. Let's go on to Acts 21. Acts chapter 21, verse 17. Acts chapter 21, verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. This is, I believe, Luke that's writing this from his own experience. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law, and they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, so Paul has gone to Jerusalem at this point, and he's talking to the church there at Jerusalem, and they're telling, you know, this is a little bit, the, the, if you go to the temple, they're going to be a little bit upset about this, so they're probably going to come together and make a problem. So he says, must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that, thou, that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. So they already wrote to Paul back in chapter, I think, 15. They wrote to Paul basically addressing this issue already. He said that, that they observe no such thing. They don't need to observe circumcision or all the laws, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day Purifying himself with them, he entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. But, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia. So there's Alexander and his gang. I don't know if Alexander was specifically there, but, you know, he was... Uh, certainly instrumental, I mean, from reading this, it seems like he was certainly instrumental. Anyways, there were these people, these Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all the men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further, brought Greeks also into the temple, and have polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. In all the city... So you notice the accusations here. None of the accusations from these Jews from Asia were... Well, he follows Jesus Christ, or claims that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You notice that was not their accusation. Okay. Their accusations were not to say that he's a Christian and therefore... No, their accusation was that he's teaching the Gentiles not to follow the law. Okay. As there was a division in the church between those who were of the circumcision and those who were of the uncircumcision. or It specifically refers to those who were of the circumcision, those who taught the doctrine that you have to be circumcised before you can be part of the church. Okay. And so... So th these were people who were very likely part of that, originally part of that fellowship at Ephesus. They were originally part of that group of 
believers at Ephesus. These were people that Paul knew and were friends with at one point that had betrayed Paul. So let's go back now to Ephesians. Now that we have a bit of the history of what's leading up to this, at, at this point now, Paul is already... Oh, I'm sorry. Let's, let's continue reading. Um, we, we've got some more to read in Acts. Let's go to verse 40. So we're going to start at verse 31 and continue... Sorry, verse 30 and continue to verse 40. And all the people, all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So now the Romans know what's going on. Who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating Paul, of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and, that, and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another, among the multitude. And when they could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was borne by of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, Away with him! And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian which before these days madest an uproar and led us out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? So the centurion, is, uh, the chief captain, is confusing him with someone else that had stirred up some trouble before. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue. And then we see he goes on and speaks. You can read chapter 22, what he, he says to them. He took an opportunity of this whole situation to tell his testimony, to tell of how he got there, what happened, what did he do to tell about how Christ met him on the road to Damascus. He took the opportunity to further the gospel. So even though his brethren betrayed him, even though those he trusted betrayed him, the Lord used it to bring forth Christ's testimony. And we see that as it goes on here throughout the rest of the book of Acts, we actually see that Paul goes to he speaks in front of Festus. He speaks in front of, um, he goes to Rome and speaks even in front of the emperor. So he goes and he spreads the gospel throughout the Roman Empire because of the betrayal of some brethren. So it was an opportunity. God used this whole situation to bring the gospel further. Let's go ahead and go back to Ephesians now. Ephesians chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 11, 2, verse 11, 12. Okay, if you turn to chapter 11 or 12 in Ephesians, then we'll have to wonder what kind of Bible you're using because there shouldn't be a chapter 11 or 12. Okay, wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. But at, uh, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall, a partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, 
even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. You see that? He abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man. There's that word anthropos there. Or mankind. One, one group. One group together. So making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body of the cross, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. And there we get our, our fourth uh, soon word. And this is a conjugation between, um, where is it? Sum polites. Sum polites. And this means union and citizen. A citizen. So we're on equal footing. We're as, as citizens within God's kingdom, the same as a Jew within the church. Both are the same. Whether or not one follows circumcision or uncircumcision is irrelevant. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So, you know, us coming together as a church, it's the same as, even better than, the temple in Jerusalem where God would come down and dwell. When we come together as a church, it's a holy thing. And, and having the presence of God here has got to be our number one priority. Having God's presence in among us when we come together to meet. And we see here in verse 1, the reason why I wanted to read verse 1 is of chapter 3. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So at this time, Paul's a prisoner writing to the church at Ephesus. Okay? He's already been taken as a prisoner when he writes to them. And uh, why is he a prisoner? Why is he a prisoner? What is the cause? What is the cause? It says, for this cause. What cause? so that the Gentiles could be on equal footing within the church, so that the Gentiles could hear the gospel, so that the church would be available to the Gentiles. That is the cause. And we, we'll see that as we go on later, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So that's why there was a reason why Paul was a prisoner, not just because these, these people he trusted betrayed him, but because God had a purpose. God had a purpose to further the gospel. God had a purpose to reach more and for his glory. And so, yeah, we can see that purpose again reading through 19 and 22. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of with the saints and of the household of God. Amen. So I would like to go back now and just read. Um, Paul, when he was uh, going to Jerusalem, before he left Asia, he was at this, uh, this city um, called Miletus. It's just a day's journey from Ephesus. He was at the coast there. Uh, this is just a coastal city. And, and he called for the elders to come, to come and meet with him from the church at Ephesus. It'd be the last time you have a chance to speak with them and to meet with them. He spent three, three or so years there. But this would be the last time he would have the opportunity to speak with them through the Holy Spirit. He already knew that when he was going to Jerusalem, 
he would become a prisoner. He already knew that before this whole thing transpired. It was revealed already, if you want to read through the earlier part of chapter 19, you can see that. But I want to go to what he says to this church at Ephesus, because a lot of it, it mirrors what we're reading through Ephesians. It, it's very similar to what we're actually reading through Ephesians. The message is very much the same. 19, chap, Acts chapter 19, verse 17. I'm sorry, no, Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And we see, you know, Alexander definitely fit in that description. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore, and fell on Paul's neck, and kissed him, sorrowing most of all, for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. So what I just want to bring from this message here is, you know, that the persecution, the first point would be that the persecution against Paul you know, it came not only from those who are the Gentiles and the Jews, but also from those who profess to be Christians. Okay, so don't be surprised when if persecution comes your way, if it isn't from those who you once trusted and once fellowshiped with. The persecution came to Paul because he stood. The second point is, is that the persecution came to Paul because he stood for what was right. He preached the truth. They didn't like it. He preached the truth that people didn't have to be circumcised to be part of the church. He preached sound doctrine. 
And they didn't agree. They didn't like this. Third thing is that the persecution that came to Paul, it wasn't just for his suffering. There was a purpose. It was to further the gospel. And it furthered the gospel to all of all of this, the known world at that time was able to reach the Gentiles. And the fourth thing is, for what cause was Paul persecuted? The reason why he was persecuted was so that we could be reached. We could, we could be part of the church, that the Gentiles could be part of the church. So if God brings persecution our way, you know, it's, let's keep in mind there's a reason for it. God wants to spread his word. He wants to spread his message. He wants people to, to be able to come to him and, and more people to hear his word. So there's a reason for it. Okay, even, if, even when the people who bring accusation against Paul thought that they were doing him harm, he said, no, this is for the glory of God. This is for the glory of God that they do this. Okay. Thank you.